Our message this morning will be based on the words that we find in 1 Kings chapter 12, the verses 1 through 20. So the first 20 verses of 1 Kings uh, chapter uh, 12. So the situation is that Solomon has passed away, he's died, and Rehoboam, his son, is uh, to um, be the next king in line. And so he goes to, uh, to Shechem, and meeting together with all the people of Israel, also the northern tribes of Israel, in order to be crowned as, as king over all of Israel. But we see that rebellion then takes place. So let us then begin reading God's word in verse 1. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone there to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon. He returned from Egypt. And so they sent for Jeroboam, and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, Your father had put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. Rehoboam answered, Go away for three days, and then come back to me. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. They replied, If today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. He asked them, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? The young man who had grown up with him replied, these people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with, with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam. As the king had said, come back to me in three days. The king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given him by the elders. He followed the advice of the young men and said, my father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from the Lord to fulfill the word of the Lord, uh, the, to fulfill the word the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, a son of Nebat, uh, through Ahijah and Sh the Shilonite. When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, what share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, Israel. Look after your own house, David. So the Israelites went home. But as for the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. King Rehoboam sent out Adonai, Adoniram, who was in charge of forced labor. But all Israel stoned him to death. King Rehoboam, however, managed to get into his chariot and escape to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. When all the Israelites heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. Only the tribe of Judah remained loyal unto the house of David. So far, reading from God's holy word. Brothers, sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, we may ask ourselves this morning as we read these words from Scripture, what does true leadership, what does true leadership really look like? How do leaders behave? How should they act? Or what is the goal that true leaders should be striving for as they lead? You know, those are questions that husbands and fathers need to ask themselves as they exercise their leadership roles. It's also the question that business leaders, government leaders, police, judges, teachers need to wrestle with 
in their calling as well. And it is also a crucial question that church leaders, whether they be ministers, elders, or, or deacons, need to be taken into account and thinking about for themselves. Because we know that those who live under good leadership will be blessed. But those who live under poor leadership will indeed suffer and suffer much. In 1 Kings chapter 12, we have an example, you can say, of some poor leadership in Israel. And the result of King Rehoboam's leadership is that the nation of Israel is torn apart. And the foundation for Israel's destruction many years later, when Israel is taken into exile in, by Assyria and Babylon, that foundation for destruction was being laid here. And so you can say also, as we look over the past centuries, the destruction of families, the destruction of nations and of empires, the destruction also of churches, can all be traced back again to a lack of good and wise leadership. This story teaches us, on the other hand, that even when there is poor leadership, God is still the one who is in control. And the Lord God is still busy directing all the events that take place here in this world to the glorious goal that he has set for his creation. In other words, what we also learn from this story is that God is not dependent on earthly leaders to direct things towards his purpose. In fact, we find often that the Lord will use poor leadership, even unwise leadership, in order to fulfill his calling and to fulfill his purpose. He does that in order that he might show that he is wiser and that he is more powerful than we human beings. And so, yes, good leadership is important. But ultimately, we live under the wonderful leadership of the Lord, our God, who is sovereign. And today, beloved, you can say that we now live under the glorious rule of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who reigns from heaven. And under his rule, we experience his loving care, for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And so this morning, I may proclaim to you God's word under this theme, the true leadership it serves to lighten the burden of God's people. So our theme, true leadership, serves to lighten the burden of God's people. And under that theme, we'll look at three, uh, four things that come out of our, our text. Uh, first of all, we'll look at a heavy burden that can be placed upon those who do not give good leadership. We'll look at the contrast and advice that you find here in our text. We'll look at that there's an increasing burden as we go through the events that happen here. And in the last place, we'll look at a joyful leadership. The story begins saying that Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone there to make him a king. So Solomon has now died, and his son Rehoboam is now to be crowned, crowned as the next king of Israel. The place Shechem played an important role in the history of the God's people Israel. Remember that it's here that, that Abraham and many, the forefather of Israel and then his grandson Jacob uh, erected altars to worship God. And also at Shechem that you have the founding of the nation of Israel uh, taking place when they, uh, when they came into the land under Joshua. Because after Israel came into the land, all of Israel uh, came to Shechem. And there they gather to renew the covenant with the Lord as one nation under God. The nation has been blessed under the leadership of King David and under the leadership of David's son, Solomon. Under Solomon, the nation, you could say, reached new heights in power and riches and glory. And so when you read his opening words, they seem to be very promising. Solomon's son goes up to Shechem. Shechem is in the middle of, uh, of, of the land to the north of, of Judah. And he goes there for his coronation as the king of Israel. But very quickly, it becomes clear that Israel, and we're talking here, when we talk about Israel here, we're talking about the ten tribes, uh, the northern tribes of Israel. They're not so eager to make him their king. 
In fact, we're told that they sent for Jeroboam. Jeroboam is a man who fled from Solomon to, to, to Egypt. They call him to come and to lead them in negotiations with King Rehoboam. And they said to Rehoboam, they said in verse 4, they said, no, your father Solomon, he put a heavy yoke on us. Now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke that he put on us, and we then we will serve you. So you find here there's an underlying tension between, between Roobo, uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, who uh, now has returned back from Egypt. Jeroboam. Remember Jeroboam? Uh, and keep in mind here, there's Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Often you kind of confuse those two, two names because they sound a bit familiar. And sometimes I might even mix them up as I'm, as I'm talking. So correct that in your, in your mind if, if that should happen. But remember that uh, Jeroboam uh, served Solomon. And Solomon had put him in charge of the whole labor force of the tribes of Joseph, that would be Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, King Solomon had built a great and impressive uh, kingdom. But in order, to, that he was, in order to be able to do so, what he had done is he had forced the people uh, to do the work for him. And so in the passage we read in chapter 11, verse 27, they we're told that he built terraces and filled the gaps in the wall of the city of Jerusalem. That was already quite a bit, but, but he did much more than that. If you go back earlier in this book, in chapter 9, verse 15, and there we're told that he conscripted forced labor from the people. To do what? Well, to build the Lord's temple. If that had been all, I think the people would have been happy to do that. But he did more than that. He also built his own palaces. And he built many palaces for the many foreign wives that he had married. And he built the terraces. And he rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem. But also the walls of the cities of Megiddo and Gezer. So what happened under Solomon was that he forced the people to build all these massive projects all over the kingdom. And that was a heavy burden that Solomon forced upon the people. But it's worse than that, much worse. Because we also read that Solomon forsook the worship of the God of Israel. Yes, he built a beautiful temple for God in Jerusalem. But what he also did is he married foreign wives who introduced, chapter 11 says, the worship of Ashtoreth, the God of the Sidonians, the God Shemosh, the God of the Moabites, and Moloch, the God of the Ammonites. And so the heavy burden was not only the excessive taxes and the forced labor that he placed upon the people, but he also led the people of Israel away from the true worship of the Lord God. And so God had come to Jeroboam in chapter 11, verse 31, and told Jeroboam that I'm going to tear the kingdom away from Solomon. And I'm going to make you, Jeroboam, I'm going to make you the king over the ten tribes of Israel in the north. So God already said, Solomon's actions are going to lead to a great schism, a great split in the kingdom. This schism is a result of poor and corrupt leadership in Israel. You see, Solomon's goals was not to care for the needs of the people but it was to serve his own personal needs. His goal was about building a great legacy for himself. His task, his calling from God was to serve the people. And instead, what did he do? He used the people to serve himself. Corrupt leadership. Beloved does not ask, what do the people need? But how do I best... Or ask, how do I best serve the people that God has placed under my care? But it says, how can I best use this leadership position to advance my own needs and to advance my own reputation and to advance my own desires? That's when leadership goes off the rails. Now, these two leadership styles, good leadership, poor leadership, is further developed in the contrast in advice that Rehoboam receives. The king asks the people, give me some three days to think about your request, whether I should lighten the burden or not. It's always wise to take some time to think about how to respond to 
difficult questions into difficult situations. You need to think them through. You need to think, how do I respond to this in a good way? And so Rehoboam has some time to get advice and to think about what he's going to do. So first of all, what does he do? Well, he goes and he consults the elders, literally the older men. Actually, even go back even further, he refers to the men with beards. So he, he consults the elderly who have served his father Solomon. These are men who have life experience. And therefore, they would also hopefully have gained some wisdom over the years. And so they advise uh, Rehoboam, say, if today you will be a servant to these people and you will serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. Notice these, these men, these elders are wise enough to realize that a ruler does not gain the loyalty of his people by forcing his own agendas and his own desires upon them. No, they stress to Rehoboam that he is to act as a servant to the people. And a servant is somebody who understands that they are called to, to serve others and not to be served. Leadership is not about what you can do for me, but it's about what I can do for you. Jesus himself said that very thing. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, he said that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom to many. Think about the Lord Jesus, very son of God. The Lord Jesus not have every right to make whatever demands that he desired from us. But he didn't do that. And he didn't come to impose his will on us. Nobody do. He came to serve us by giving his very own life for us. And so, beloved, true leadership in every situation is always about the needs of those you are called to serve. That means as parents, you are called to serve your children. Government leaders are called to, to serve the citizens of their nation. And leaders in the church are called to serve those Christ has placed under their care. But Rehoboam rejected the advice of the elders. He did not consider himself to be a servant, but he expected to be served by the people. And then he consulted with the young men. These were men without life experience, men who had grown up with him and who were now serving him. And the arrogance of these young men comes through loud and clear. You almost can hear them thinking to themselves, we are the new leaders. We're the new generation of leaders. We get to decide now what we're going to do. And we demand from you, the people, that you now serve us. And that youthful arrogance, it comes out in the crude way in which they give their advice. Notice how they say to Rehoboam, now tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. It's like young people today right in the streets who are giving their finger to, to people, older people who are there on the streets with them. And then he goes on and he says, my father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. You see, they understood leadership to mean that they could demand whatever they wanted from the people. If you dare to defy what we tell you, we will make your life a living hell. There's no respect. There is no love for the people. They have no concern for the well-being of the nation. They have no compassion. There is no mercy. You see, beloved, power has the ability to corrupt the heart of people completely. And the hearts of these men have become cold. There is no love for the very people God has called them to serve. And as we reflect on that, 
we need to think of this in a bigger context. Remember, God had appointed Rehoboam's grandfather, David, to be the king of Israel. The people of Israel, therefore, are God's people. They belong to God. That means they are precious in the eyes of God. God gave David and David's family after him the mandate to watch over and to care for the people like a shepherd cares for his sheep. The people of Israel should be as dear to the heart of the king as they are dear to the heart of Almighty God. David said to, or God said to David, David, I, will give, I have given you charge over my people. Now go and take care of my people. Serve them as a people who are dear and who are precious in my eyes. Well, there was none of that here in his grandson Rehoboam's life. Oh, the elders that he first consulted, they were wise enough to understand it. But their good advice is rejected. And the young Turks wanted to force their will instead on the people. They saw an opportunity to increase the burden uh, on the people and make the people's life even more difficult for their own gain and for their own pleasure. Now remember that God promised David, one day, David, I will give you a great son. And your son, he will reign over my people forever, for eternity. Well, you know that that son, of course, that God was promising ultimately, ultimately was not Rehoboam, but we know today that that son is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you find this contrasting style of leadership again in the life of David's great son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, when he came to this world, he heard the cry of the people, people who experienced the great burden under earthly rulers. And he says to them in Matthew 11, verse 28, he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Notice, beloved, Jesus is a different kind of leader. His heart goes out to the people. He sees, he understands their burdens, and he is humble and gentle with them. And he serves them by removing the heavy burden from their life. You see, the leadership approach of the Lord Jesus is different from that of the spiritual leaders in Israel in those days. That's so what I read from Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23, verse 1 and following, Jesus addresses the teachers and the Pharisees. And, and he says about them, he says, you know what they, these leaders in Israel do? They tie heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But you notice that they themselves are not willing to lift a finger? The Pharisees have put heavy burdens on the people. They have given the people rule upon rule upon rule. They made spiritual demands one upon another that they expected the people to follow in order that they might be saved. They threatened the people and said, if you do not keep all these rules and all of these laws and do them, you will not be saved and you have no part of us. But Jesus says, you know what? But those demands are demands that no ordinary person can keep. In fact, Jesus says, even you Pharisees, you hypocrites, you do not even lift a finger to keep them because you can't. So what did Jesus do as a leader? Well, Jesus, when he came, he saw the people crushed under the burdens of these laws. He saw how the people, how they were weighed down under the, under the demands of their leaders. And Jesus says, I did not come to make your burdens heavier, but I came to make your yoke easy and your burden light. He, didn't, he did that by coming 
to save his people, or, but to serve his people by saving them. In his compassion, Jesus says, he says, I see that you cannot carry the, the burden that your leaders have placed upon you. But I will carry them for you. Yes, I will carry them for you. And today, beloved, leaders in the church also need to understand that our role as leaders in the church is not to force people or to make people live according to certain rules and certain regulations. For if our Christian life is just about keeping the rules, if it's always only about doing the right things, about living perfect lives, then Jesus understands that that will crush you. It will crush you. Spiritual leaders do not come with heavy demands. But they come with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That does not mean that the leaders in the church should not admonish people when they live sinful lives. It doesn't mean that spiritual leaders in the church shouldn't demand people to serve God according to his holy will. Although the Lord Jesus himself in his lifetime also ex revealed his compassion and his mercy. Remember many occasions he, he commanded his people to be, to be obedient to the will of God. But how did he do that? How did he show that leadership? Remember that when the people brought to him a woman who had been caught in adultery in John chapter 8. And then Jesus said to the people, who, he who is without sin, let him throw the first stone. But none did, and they all walked away. At the end of that event, Jesus says to the adulteress who was sitting there before him, or standing there, he says, now go and leave your life of sin. Jesus showed compassion, but he also called her out of her life of sin. Spiritual leaders do not overlook sin, but they speak about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive sins. True leaders understand that the first need for everyone who lives in sin, the first need that we have, beloved, is not to change. When somebody comes to understand who Christ is, the first thing we do is and say, no, first of all, you have to change your life. That's not their first need. The first need is to seek the forgiveness of Christ. Because, beloved, no one, no one can change their life without knowing the love, without knowing the compassion of Jesus Christ. No one can submit to the will of God until they experience the care and the compassion of Jesus Christ. Until you experience Jesus Christ as the one who lifted the great burden of sin from your shoulders. Only when he has done that for you, and he will do that for you when you seek that from him, then it is a joy, and it becomes a delight to serve him as our Lord and as our King. And yet what happens, beloved, is so often we, we fall into what we call legalism. Legalism in which we impose the law upon ourselves and others as if this is the means by which we obtain Christ's mercy and Christ's love. But beloved, the reality is that you can never earn the love of Christ. The reality is that you can never save yourself through your own efforts. That is too heavy of a burden for each one of you. Well, Christ came and he bore that burden. He came and he took our sins to the cross. He paid for them by his death so that the burden of sin could be lifted from our lives. Rehoboam, or later on the Pharisees, they're not the kind of rulers and leaders that we need, but Christ. Christ is the spiritual ruler that we need. And he is the one that, beloved, that we now have. Now what happens in Israel is that the people rebel and they refuse to serve Rehoboam as their king and only make their burden heavier. God had already said uh, that this would happen and that this was, uh, and that it was his will that the schism, the split in Israel uh, should take place. 
But that does not mean that the people, that what they did, that what they did was right. On the one hand, you need, you have the king. The king abuses his people. But the people do not realize the consequences for themselves when they now rebel against Rehoboam. Verse 16 reveals how serious this rebellion is. Right? When the people of Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, then they answered the king with these words, and they said, What share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, Israel. Look after your own house, David. See what they're doing? They think they're throwing off the yoke of Rehoboam. And yet their decision will have catastrophic consequences and make their burden even heavier. That's because they make a separation from the house of David. They didn't want any part anymore in Jesse's son, David. To your tents, Israel, meaning we will go to our own home, and you, Judah, you look after your own house, which is the house, the family of David. Now you may say, so, so why is this so serious? Remember, God had appointed David to be the king over Israel. And in his covenant with the people of Israel, God promised that he would send the Messiah, the Savior, and that the Savior would come through the family of King David. God had promised David. He says, you will receive a son, and your son will reign upon your throne forever. And when he comes, then he will be the Savior of his people. So what is Israel doing then? Israel, in effect here, is rejecting the wonderful promise of God. Their only hope rests in that covenant promise God had made to David. And by turning their backs on Rehoboam, as understandable as it might be within this situation, will nevertheless will lead to the destruction of Israel. And that is indeed what happened to a, a, a large extent. Remember, many, many years later, many generations later, the ten tribes of Israel, they're taken out of the land into exile, and they will never again return to the land. The ten tribes, you can, in effect, are lost, and only a remnant of the tribe of Judah that also went into exile at a later, date, at a later time, only a remnant of Judah returns from their exile. And so what happens here is while the people seek to free themselves from the burden of Rehoboam, they only increase the burden upon themselves. Yes, their grievances, they are justified, but rejecting the promise of God to David will have eternal consequences. So true leadership always brings God's people back again to the promises of God. Today, leaders in the church serve the congregation by turning their attention, the attention of God's people, again to the promises of God that have been given in Christ Jesus. When you think about the work of ministers, elders, and deacons, also when we think this morning of the ordination of new elders in the congregation, we think about our task. We're called to serve the congregation. How? By reminding God's people about the promises God has given in Jesus Christ. And you look at the history of the church, it reveals many Christian churches that have become shipwrecked. Why did they become shipwrecked? Because the leaders no longer preached Christ Jesus. They no longer made Jesus the focus in the lives of God's people, in the lives of their worship. And be that when Jesus becomes secondary, Perhaps because we are promoting legalism. So you don't even always realize that you, how we make Jesus sec secondary when we promote legalism and a, a con conformity to, to, the, to the rules and the laws. Or Jesus might become secondary because the church only preaches a social gospel of being good people and doing good deeds. What's happening then is that people are being separated from their great shepherd, Jesus Christ. What a tragedy. When the, the focus of the leadership is no longer on Jesus Christ. What they do, they, they, se they separate the people from the only Savior, Jesus. Then what we do is we place a heavy burden on the people that they cannot carry for, and now the people have to figure out how they're going to save themselves. 
And so you brothers, elders, deacons, also as, as ministers, we have a wonderful task of directing everyone to Jesus Christ as, uh, as their Savior. Because in Christ, the burden of God's people will be made easy and their yoke will be made light. For in Christ, God's people will experience the joy of eternal life. When you rule well, you will also experience joy in your leadership. And one of the dangers of leadership is that leaders think that they have to do everything. Everything is up to us. Right? If there's a problem, uh, the way to fix it is simply to work harder. If things do not go well, leaders tend to, to blame themselves. And you know, we all, we all can look at, our, at ourselves and, and we see the things that we have, have done and we think, no, we could have done those things better. Think of fathers and mothers who look back on the life of a wayward child and they think, you know, if, if only, if only I had done this, if only I had done that, things might be different. Or leaders in the church, they look back on their work and, and they see many weaknesses and many failures in the work that they have done. But beloved, we need to be aware that leaders too can be very quickly guilty of the sin of idolatry. We become guilty of idolatry when we think that everything depends upon us and doing everything well and doing everything perfect. Idolatry is when we begin to think to ourselves, if only I had done this, it might have made a difference in that person's life. If only I had known that person's problems, I could have helped and I could have made a difference. And so we can beat ourselves up as if everything depends on us. But beloved, then what happens is we put too much importance upon ourselves and we act as if we need to give God a hand in his work. What God does, God uses weak, sinful people to carry out his work. God reveals his greatness through our weakness. And that comes through clearly also here in this story. Verse 15, the comment is made that the king did not listen to the people. Why? For this turn of events was from the Lord. To fulfill the word of the Lord to Jeroboam. And we think, what a horrible thing happened here. And yes, you can argue if only, if only Rehoboam would have acted differently. If only the people had not rebelled things would have been different for Israel. But beloved, God does not depend on our human leadership to determine his will being done here on this earth. We're told that God himself determined this course of action. And why? We know that under Solomon, Israel was on the way to becoming a great nation, even a great empire. If Solomon had his way, that's what he would have done. That's what he wanted. But Israel needed to be humbled. For God's purpose was not for the people of Israel to become a great nation and a great empire that would rule over other nations of the earth. This could not be the case. I mean, this could have been the case. It could have happened if Israel had stayed together and continued on the course that Solomon had placed them on. But instead, God directed things so that his purpose for the coming of the Messiah would be fulfilled. Israel was indeed to become a blessing to all the nations as God had promised to Abraham and promised to David. But they would become a blessing to the nations not through a physical kingdom in which they would rule over other kingdoms on this earth. But they would become a blessing to the nations by becoming a spiritual kingdom. The son who would come from David he would not sit on an earthly throne like David did, but his throne would be a throne that would be for eternity. And his throne would be situated in heaven where he is today. That's where Christ is ruling over us today, beloved. And therefore, leaders in the church need to keep this in mind. We do not lead in our own strength, nor even through our own wisdom, but we lead only under the great shepherd, Jesus Christ. And the reality is that we often fail in our leadership. We do not always give good or wise direction 
We do not always give good advice. But that should not discourage any one of you. Christ looks to us to be faithful leaders. That is, leaders who love him. Leaders who want to serve him with our whole heart. But he does not expect you to solve all the problems and to save everyone. That takes a burden. It takes a burden from your shoulders. And it helps to lighten the burden. Beloved, you don't have to carry the burden of leadership all alone on your shoulders. For Jesus Christ is the great shepherd who leads us. And our greatest joy is that we may be an instrument, albeit an imperfect instrument, but we may be an instrument in the hands of our Savior. And that, that beloved, that's enough. Amen.